Hey guys, this is Kev Ryan here with another battle report. This is going to be the battle report for the actual first round of the Rising Sun Tabletop Simulator Team event by Vol SC. In this particular campaign, I will be representing Onyx Contact Force as part of the combined army team, while my opponent is going to be playing Assassin's Bayram as part of the uh, Hakizlam team. This campaign is going to be pretty close to ITS standard, uh, not ITS 13, there's none of the extras, and there are going to be some custom Vol SC missions, but really the only major differentiations from standard Infinity are that there is some form of limited insertion protection, and we also have what's called a cam core, which is kind of a role-playing character that tags along. The way the limited insertion protection works is if you have a single combat group, your opponent can spend a command token and restrict you to spending at most 12 orders during the course of the turn. Uh, impetuous orders don't count, but tactical awareness and lieutenant orders do. I am going to be running limited insertion, so that is relevant, but it's not quite the same protection as uh, being completely immune to everything, which is what happened in the crit league, for example. The other thing is that we both have what's called a cam core, a campaign correspondent. These dudes are basically like schmucks with pistols at the start, but over the course of the campaign they will get mildly better. They don't generate orders, uh, I think they count as specialists, but they can't fire team with anyone yet, maybe in future rounds they can. Uh, basically they're just a warm body that kind of stands around and, and, you know, represents you. For this first round, the mission is Neuralnet. This is a Vol SC custom mission. It's a really, really good mission, but I've talked about it a whole bunch in other battle reports, so I won't go into too much detail here. Basically, there are nine buttons arrayed in the standard 3x3 grid, and you gotta push them. One of the buttons is secretly encrypted, which means that you can't push it. And you get a bonus on the first turn, just plus three, and you get a penalty on the last turn, minus three. So you have to balance pushing buttons with attacking and that sort of thing. If you're looking for a mission that's not just Annihilation, I really recommend Neuralnet. That said, I have other battle reports talking about Neuralnet, so I will move on to the lists next. So here is something like my opponent's list. Obviously, the groupings aren't exactly right. Basically, what I remember, though, is that there were only two Asawiras, the Doctor and the Lieutenant. There were, like, four Muyibs, most of them the heavy rocket launcher profiles with tactical awareness, but also a Spitfire. There was Yarahadad, a Daylami, a Daylami, uh, two Nadirs, uh, I guess one's right here and one's right here. The Nadirs and the Daylamis are going to be particularly problematic in general for my Onyx Contact Force list because I don't have any smoke. So I basically have to either, you know, discover shoot the Delamis, which can be inefficient and failure prone, and for the Nadirs, I really just have to wait till they show up and then deal with them. And then there are three Mutts, uh, but only one of the Mutts has smoke grenades. The Mutts changed a lot between N3 and N4. In N3, I think you could just take one profile that had basically all the good gear. These days, you gotta spread it out across multiple profiles or pay for, like, the pointing shotgun guy or something. So my opponent has chosen to take one with smoke grenades, one with an Emirat, one with a Jammer. Notably absent from this list are the actual assassins. There are no Fides and no Algebel. And that's honestly a fairly good thing for me. I was a little bit concerned that if I had to go second against a Fide, there's not really much in my list that can handle it. Sure, Norkius and the Umber Samaritan are pretty good in close combat, but nothing else is, and I think a Fide can do a lot of damage. But there are no Fides, so I don't have to worry about that. Next up is my list. The title of the list is a little wrong. It's actually DDE, so if you hear me talking about it in the future, they're the same thing. This represents a bit of an iteration from the previous version of Blender Boys. I still have the Umbra, Zeodron, Norkius, Harris because it's very, very good, but I have ditched the Overdrawn in favor of getting the Suryat Heavy Rocket Launcher Multispectral Visor 1. That dude is going to be super important because he can see through smoke. Then, because I wanted to be able to give him burst 2 in ARO specifically, I've opted to try to upgrade to get Kerr now. I think Kerr now is a pretty good fit for this list. He's a wild card, which is nice. He has a plasma rifle, which if you've seen any battle reports where I use Hector, you know I think are very, very deadly. He has pitchers, which can be useful in case uh, Bit and Kiss run out of them. And he also has white noise. The white noise is particularly exciting because I've given up the overdrawn with its albedo. Onyx doesn't have any smoke, so this is the closest thing that I'll get. The only downside to Kurnow is he's not particularly tough, and if I want to slot him into the Umbra Zeodron Norkius Harris, he doesn't have super jump, so it won't be able to jump everyone around. Even so, those are minor details and not that important. Other than that, I've actually dropped the two Imitrons so that I could have two Icadrons instead. I have Bit and Kiss per usual, and I have the T-Drone for missiles. One way I could change this list is I could take the Icadron, turn it into two Imitrons, and then maybe move the second Icadron into group two. You know, having a spare order to slot back in or something like that. But I really like running actual true limited insertion, so I'm not going to do that. So ultimately, what this list has that the other one didn't have is it's got access to white noise, it's got access to MSV, especially in ARO, and it's got two Harris's which can be more flexible. 
What it gives up is the overdrawn albedo with its burst five heavy rapid magnetic cannon. So if I'm up against a faction that's known for taking, you know, big beefy tags like a Merut, maybe I'll be a little bit sad. I've still got a ridiculous hacking threat, so maybe that's not that big of a deal, but it's still something I got to think about. Not that Assassins has particularly big tags that I'm going to be worried about, but it's just something in general. That done, let's talk about the game. The map is a Vol SC custom map. I think it uses a lot of his custom terrain that he's been building in Blender. This ends up, in my opinion, looking really, really good. One thing that was really clever are there are a couple elevators around, I think one right here and one right here. They didn't end up having a super big impact on the game, especially because most of my active pieces have super jump, but the idea of the elevators is something I find really interesting. Also, uh, I think a lot of this other stuff is Vol SC custom as well. And what you can do, the way he's designed it, is you can reskin these things to have a different themed map. So here we have a sort of spaceship interior themed map with a lot of the XCOM assets. But you can imagine a different version of this map where you reskin all the buildings to have more of a sandy, you know, desert type theme. So it's a really good looking map. That said, it is also a fairly short ranged map. Just about the only long range air rows that are actually going to matter throughout the course of this game are this one. And uh, there is a bit of a long line over this way. There may be other long range lines of fire, but they're just not going to show up in this game. Next, let's talk about deployment. I won the lieutenant role and decided to go first. I think limited insertion lists like to go first in general. They're just too fragile and can't afford to lose pieces like left and right. And also, I was specifically worried about the damage that an assassin could do to my list. So I definitely wanted to go first. I have the Suryat uh, HFG Lieutenant here, Kurnow here, MSV over here. I didn't start these guys in a Harris, but I can form it at the end of my turn so that this guy can be on defensive duty. This is my Camcore, he won't do much. Ikadron, Ikadron, Missilebot, and then this is the Tag Samaritan Harris. Last, you have Bit and Kiss over here. Those are the ones that I withheld, and I wanted to do that because I wanted to be able to put them down in exactly the right spot in order to drop pitchers on my opponent's head. Meanwhile, here's my opponent's deployment. He has Yara, Asawira Doctor, Muya HRL over there, Camcore right here, Delami right here. This Delami, I think, was his withheld piece. I'm not really sure. The three Mutts are over there, and then you've got Asawira, AP Rifle Guy, uh, Muyab Heavy Rocket Launcher, Muyab Heavy Rocket Launcher, Gulam Doctor, and Muyab Spitfire. As far as Nadirs go, one of them was right here, and one of them was right here. And that's pretty much it. Of course, the key weakness in this deployment, especially going second against my list, is that these guys are all super duper bunched up. This Harris was also originally bunched up and they got spread out, um, but my opponent did not really want to spread these guys out too much. Uh, I'm not sure why, but it is definitely something that I'll be taking advantage of. Now, if he had gotten to go first, I do think that this particular pain train would really, really, really be dangerous. There's just a butt ton of orders in that length. The three tactical awareness moves are absolutely crazy. And while my uh, Zeodron in particular can sandbag with the best of them, Bioimmunity means that he's always going to be saving on fives or sixes or something like that, plus cover. The sheer weight of that link just being able to punch me in the face over and over again can really be problematic. So I am glad to be going first, but I think that this really, really tight, glumped up deployment is, is going to be basically the major deciding factor in this game. And honestly, the very first thing that I'm going to do is take Bit and Kiss, which are over here. Bit is going to, or maybe Kiss, the, the robot's going to peek out that window and drop one pitcher here, one pitcher here. I wasn't sure what 16 inches is. And then Kiss is going to drop the other richer right there. I get fairly lucky and all three of these go down, but honestly, I only needed this one and this one. And had they failed, Kurnow still has his pitcher. I also have an Ikadron nearby so they can refill. So being able to get these pitchers down in these positions is something that I believe I can do with fairly high reliability, and I do accomplish it. Having gotten them down, I then spend some orders targeting people. I get the target off on this center Muyub on the first roll, which is a little bit lucky. But honestly, even though it's burst one versus burst one, this is just such a juicy target that I can afford to waste the orders on it. Other things worth noting are that uh, Yara right here is within range of this pitcher as well. So once I've satisfyingly dealt with this link, I will then drop pitchers on Yara's head. My goal is to gut his attack pieces as much as I can, rather than try to, you know, deal damage to his order pool significantly. The only other thing worth mentioning is that Spotlight is actually only a short skill, and I have a Harris over here that's 6'2". So while I'm spending all those orders targeting people, I am actually going to have this link advance so that Norkius ends up in here prone, uh, I think the Umber Samaritan ends up in here prone, and the Zeodron ends up over here standing. That efficiency means that I can spend those spotlight orders also advancing, and I actually use the tactical awareness order to take some pot shots. 
In particular, during those orders, I was trying to shoot the Yasuwira who was standing right there, I think, with the K1 Marksman rifle, but the Nadir who was right there revealed, and instead of shooting at the Asawira, the Zeodron shot at the Nadir, and with Burst 4, I managed to hit the Nadir, the Nadir missed, and then the Nadir went unconscious, and that was kind of great. I don't think it was super, super lucky. Yes, the, you know, Zeodron is only on 7s or something like that because of the Mimetism minus 6 of the Nadir, but we were within 16 inches, so the Nadir is only shooting back on, like, a 12 or something. Four on sevens, one on a 12. I've got decent armor. It's pot shot anyway. It worked out for me, but it's not super, super lucky. And this is the aftermath of all the guided strikes. You can actually see that the Muyib that I originally targeted has managed to dodge and escape. I had to slap down another targeted on the Gulam Doctor because I still wanted to splash people. I've only ended up killing uh, three or four guys. This is the Asawira, but the Asawira is going to regenerate. I actually spent the NCO orders on Norkias trying to kill the Asawira, and that didn't work. So it is fairly lucky that the Asawira was able to regenerate because that was his lieutenant. And otherwise, I've only actually killed three people. I killed the uh, Gulam Doctor, one of the Muyib Heavy Rocket Launchers, and I killed Yara. That also consumed all five of my guided missile strikes. One of them missed, and then I spent two putting Yara in the ground permanently because I didn't want her to get regenerated. All of which is to say that despite my opponent really clumping up his guys really close together, I haven't dealt that much damage in terms of how many pieces I've killed. Really, the primary damage is that I have gutted the main attack pieces of the Link and also littered pitchers all over the place in really annoying places. Sadly, I did not have any orders left to push any buttons. It just took too long in order to drop pitchers on people's heads. But, you know, that's, that's basically going to be fine. So it's now my opponent's turn. He is really feeling the hurt because of all the damage I've dealt to him. He's happy that his Oswear was able to regenerate, but his Link has been gutted. He's lost a lot of pieces. And with that in mind, he's thinking that he has got to attack. In particular, he's going to take this Link, run it into the middle, and gunfight this Suryat Heavy Rocket Launcher, on whom I have reformed the Harris so he can be on ARO duty. During that process, the whole area is littered with repeaters. I think there was actually a plan to use the, the Mutts who were over here to run and try to throw smoke over here and cover an advance or something like that, but the Mutts fail their smoke roll and my opponent just decides he doesn't want to spend all his command tokens trying to make that happen. So this is where this link ends up, uh, or as it's traveling across the middle. The Asawira has stealth, which means that I won't be able to hack it until the link does something. But once they start shooting, I'll be able to have Bit and Kiss both dropping Oblivions. Uh, sorry, not Bit and Kiss. The Umbra and Bit dropping Oblivions onto this guy. Meanwhile, these guys are not stealthy, so I am able to target both of them as we maneuver along. Once we get here, the, uh, the Muyib Spitfire is able to stand on this corner and gunfight the Suryat. He manages to put one wound on the Suryat, that's that's pretty darn likely burst five. Uh, but I was shooting back against a guy that's targeted, so it wasn't super unlikely that I was going to, you know, get killed outright or get knocked unconscious. He then decides that he wants to fight the Zeodron. I don't think that affords anything. Again, I'm, I'm armor six in cover, effectively. Not much else happens. Despite my best efforts, I am not able to isolate the Asawira. BTS 9 is, I guess, pretty darn high, but mostly I just was failing. I did decide to target it with the Umbra Samaritan instead of Oblivioning because I was thinking that, you know, in future turns the targeted would be nice and that actually turned out to be correct. The only other thing that happened is Kiss was standing right here and Kiss just got gunned down by that Muyib Spitfire. Kiss, who had done nothing wrong and only was trying to give free pitchers to the Hassassin player, um, murdered in his prime of youth um, and we should all be very sad. So this is approximately where things end up. The Asawira Lieutenant was right there, and you can't really see it. The Spitfire Muyib is right there. The uh, There's another Muyib right there with a heavy rocket launcher. Um, I think that the uh, the Muyib heavy rocket launcher and Asawira Doctor moved up, and the Asawira Doctor has managed to push this button. And then there is a Ghazi with a jammer that moved into uh, Norkias' zone of control right there. It's now the second turn, so I'm thinking that I need to try to push buttons, and I'm thinking that I need to try to kill as many people as I can. What that means is I want to activate Kurnow. It looks like this picture was actually taken midway through the turn because Kurnow is already moving out. In fact, I might have already gun fought the Muyib Spitfire and Muyib Heavy Rocket Launcher there. In both cases, Kurnow is burst four on uh, 15s because the targets are targeted and in cover, and he's using the super, super, super dangerous plasma ammo. If I get unlucky, yes, things will go badly. He's pretty darn fragile. But the odds really should be in my favor here, and they are. I kill the Muyib Spitfire. I kill the Muyib Heavy Rocket Launcher. I don't think either of them even go dog it or get to use their, you know, bioimmunity nonsense. I'm just blasting them with templates for lots and lots of damage. Having done that, I then try to take Kurnow to run over to this button. I do try to push it. I then try to run over to this button. I fail to push it. I run over to this button and fail to push it also and end up with my Surya heavy rocket launcher there and then the uh, the other two guys hidden back there. 
Having done that, I then reform this Harris. I don't have that many orders left, but I want to deal with this stupid Gossi because it is kind of problematic. And I do have the two NCO orders and the technical awareness orders, so this Harris does have some mobility. The Jammer being in zone of control of Norkius might seem problematic at first, but he has stealth. So I am able to take Norkius downstairs. And then having gotten downstairs, I put the tag there, the Umber Samaritan there, and Norkius runs over and explains to this Gazi um, why having Prothion is a really good skill. I put the Gazi back after this so I can take this picture. Here is a close-up. I really love using Norkius, but the thing that's interesting here from a battle report point of view is that Norkius is also able to shift the rest of the link as he's doing this. Spending, you know, three orders to kill a Ghazi isn't that interesting, but spending three orders to get my midfield specialists closer to where they need to be, that's kind of interesting and useful. Also, because this is basically the only time Norkius is going to CC through this game, I feel like he deserves a little bit more attention. But yeah, that's my turn. I basically managed to push one button. I tried to push three other buttons and failed every single time. But most importantly, I have eaten my opponent's Harris, and in that Harris he had his lieutenant. Uh, I guess it's not his Harris, it's a three-man core, but you get the idea. And here are the other two Ghazis looking on in horror as their friend is turned into Ghazi soup and slurped up. Which brings us to my opponent's turn. He is now in loss of lieutenant, and a bunch of his guys are isolated or something, so he's not in a great position. What he does is he ends up having this Ghazi, I think, run out to try to engage Norkius. I think Norkius dodges. He has this Ghazi run out and try to throw smoke for a potential Emirat advance, uh, but I don't think anything comes of that. I, I don't know exactly what... I, I think he gets shot by the Zeodron, loses the face-to-face, -face, but tanks the roll. Uh, this is the Camcord, just not going to do anything. And then the Oswear Doctor, um, who is isolated because of all the hacking... Um, is going to try to engage the Suryat over here. Also, the Tactical Awareness Muyab is going to try to engage the Suryat as well. I get fairly lucky. The Suryat is sitting out of cover. He's in a bad position. I just ran out of orders. Um, but neither of these guys are in particularly good range, and he does have burst to an arrow, and all the enemies are targeted. And I don't know if he manages to kill anything in arrow, but he is successful at uh, not dying. And Actually, I think he does kill the Muyab Heavy Rocket Launcher in arrow. So other than that, my opponent does not accomplish much, but he's out of orders and he's in loss of lieutenant, so that's not necessarily a problem. Here's where things start for me on turn three. I am now at a minus three penalty to push buttons, and I have only pushed one. However, my order pool is basically entirely intact, so I am hopeful that I will be able to push some buttons. Sadly, the dice aren't necessarily in agreement with that proposition. I have Kurnow over here, and he spends a whole bunch of orders trying to push these two buttons. I, uh, I think he might eventually succeed, but it does take time. Meanwhile, though, the Umbra Samaritan, Norkius, and the Zeodron, there are three specialists, there's lots of orders in there, um, but they, they, they just need to, to try to push stupid buttons all over the place, and that's something they're going to have a really hard time with. I am able to use Norkius's NCO order and the Tactical Awareness order on the tag to drag the Umbra into contact with things, so every single regular order I spend on these guys is probably going to get spent trying to push a button. Unfortunately for me, I think I fail something like five times during this entire turn, and the end result is that I have succeeded at uh, this one, and uh, this one, and uh, this one, I think, and, and that's about it. So I do only end with, I think, four consoles. Meanwhile, during that whole process, this little camcord over here is taking pistol pot shots at my dudes. I don't want to spend any orders dealing with that jerk, um, be because if you know those orders spent are orders that I'm not spent pushing buttons, and everybody's got multiple wounds. But the camcord just keeps coming in and blasting and blasting and causing me problems. Eventually, I do use an NCO order on Norkius to shoot her, but uh, she managed to actually put a wound on the Umber Samaritan, which is my most reliable hacker specialist in that Harris. So, uh, you know, good job, camcord, I suppose. I'm also able to use the Tactical Awareness Order on the Zeodron to gun down the Asawira, which is nice. But it does mean that towards the end of the turn, I have not pushed as many buttons as I would like to have pushed, and um, my opponent does have a specialist left on the board, this Nadir. The Nadir revealed to take a shot at Kurnow. I did get very lucky that Kurnow and the Suryat both completely tanked the hits, um, but I did get unlucky because of how many buttons I tried to push and failed. So I run Norkius and the Samaritan over to this guy. Um, they try to CC him, and he actually crits his roll against Norkius, which means that he is going to survive. Norkius also crits, so no damage is done, but my last order is not actually spent killing anything with Norkius, which is kind of funny. And that pretty much wraps up my turn. Likewise, it also wraps up the game. My opponent really does not have anything left that he can do, so we decide to just call it here. The only other thing I want to talk about is the luck aspect in terms of the button pressing on the last turn of the game. I've mentioned several times that I got unlucky, and I think that is correct. I spent, I think, something like nine orders trying to push buttons, and I succeeded only something like three or four times. 
Because of the minus three penalty, those rolls were only on 11, so they're basically a coin toss. Even so, if you flip a coin nine times, you should expect to, you know, get a success slightly more than uh, four times rather than, you know, slightly less. But this is the kind of thing that can happen in Neuralnet, and I was aware that this is the kind of thing that can happen in Neuralnet, which is why I was trying to push buttons early on with Kernow in turn two. So in fact, I think the real bad luck were the three orders that I spent on Kernow trying to push buttons, um, during which he succeeded only one button press out of, uh, I guess it was four orders, and then uh, three failed. And in my opinion, if you want to point to bad luck in this game for me, that actually is probably where I would point to is the, is the mid-game failures of Kernow to push a button or two here and there, rather than the last turn, uh, because the last turn, it's the kind of thing that can happen. That said, it really did turn out to be quite the blowout. Um, I only had something like a, you know, a 5-1 uh, win, but, you know, it, it was pretty one-sided in terms of the devastation caused. I think it really mostly boiled down to the fact that I was able to kill key pieces with my repeaters. But it also didn't help that my opponent just had no tools with which to deal to my pitchers and hackers. He basically spent time wandering through my own repeater network, getting targeted, and having been targeted, he was not able to efficiently gunfight any of my pieces. They then ended their turn in the middle, and I just killed all of them. So yeah, that's the battle report. It was, you know, something of a slaughter fest in favor of uh, the Onyx Contact Force. I think I would have pushed more buttons had I not gotten unlucky in the way that I did, but at the same time, I don't want to complain too much about luck. This game does have some, some luck in it, and the strategy that I pursued did not involve pushing buttons on turn one, which is when, you know, the best time to push buttons is. In terms of the list, I feel like it was very effective. I liked being able to have the Suryat uh, HRL on air row with burst 2. I also liked having the Umbra Samaritan not in the Harris with the Zeodron, because that meant that the Umbra Samaritan could hack while the Zeodron was shooting, and that didn't break up the team. So being able to move people efficiently by switching my Harris around was also super nice. And generally, it just felt like a fairly solid list. I think I probably would have done very well with the other list in these circumstances as well. You know, primarily the advantage was being able to gut them with guided missiles first and foremost, and both lists have that capacity. But, you know, things did go well for me, and I'm not going to discount the fact that this list played a part in it. All of which is to say, I'm fairly happy with this. I think I'm going to stick with this, uh, you know, a little bit more moving forward. And yeah, that's the battle report. Uh, the combined army is currently doing quite well during round one of our team tournament thingy. I hope that you wish us luck. I think our plans are that once we've conquered uh, the planet, we are going to institute universal everything for everyone, uh, and it's going to be paid for by the Toha. So if that's the kind of thing that you support, then wish us luck and keep track of our games, and um, thanks for watching. I will see you guys around.